Pastor Kelvin Luke is coming to you live here at the South Rocky Mount Community Center. Yes, 719 Recreation Drive here in the great city of Rocky Mount, North Carolina. We are so thankful to be here with you on today, taken by Force Ministries and Dominion Tabernacle. As always, we're glad to be able to come and to share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ with you. And we're thankful that you've chosen to tune in with us. For those of you who are visiting with us, this, maybe this is your first time tuning in. We're so glad to have you. We're so glad to have you and thankful that you chose to stop by on today. And for those of you who are repeat uh, visitors, we want to thank you. Thank you for your continuous support. As always, we're just delighted that you uh, consider us in your, in your thoughts and your prayers and, and you support us on a, on a regular basis. As always, we invite you to please check us out on our website, takeitbyforce.net. Yes, takeitbyforce.net. And on there you can find a lot of great information, a lot of great information about who we are and what we have going on. And you can visit the different tabs that we have there online. Uh, you can visit our events tab and you can see all of the different events that we have coming up. Uh, you can check out our events for uh, this month. We've got our spirituality and sexuality and godly perspective uh, taking a stand against youth violence two great great uh, zoom initiatives that we have that we offer each month and we invite you to please check them out please check them out and you can find the link on our uh, on our website and also check out our inspirational merchandise page while you're on our website there you can find a lot of great uh, merchandise for you, especially during this time of the year. If you're looking for something warm, you're looking for a nice sweatshirt or a coffee mug, we've got that for you. And while you're there, you can check out some books that we also have, only $5 each for each book. With free shipping, with free shipping uh, for the books. So please check us out in regards to that. All right. Hey, well, listen, we're excited about the word of the Lord. I'm excited about the word of the Lord on today. We want to prepare our hearts to receive the word of the Lord. But before we do that, a simple song I want to sing. If you join in this if you would, it simply says, We bring the sacrifice of praise on today. How many of you know he's worthy? He's worthy of the praise. In spite of what we go through, in spite of what we experience in this world, the Lord is worthy to be praised. And because he's worthy, we bring, we bring it. Absolutely. We bring it with us. Each and every day that we wake up, we should bring the sacrifice of praise unto Him. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer and we offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And we offer to you the sacrifice of praise. We bring sacrifice. We bring sacrifice of praise. To the house of the Lord, we bring, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, and we offer and we offer up to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Thank you. 
According to Luke chapter 4, verse 1. We'll start there. And I'll be reading from the King James Version, as I always do. For the most part. It says there, verse 1, and Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Those days he did nothing, and when they were in it, he afterward hungered. Again, verse 2, it says there, being 40 days tempted. Uh, all right. So what I want to do on this morning, and really this will be part two of the installment that we started on last week, an appointment with the wilderness. And so on today, if we could use as a thought, we want to use as a thought on today, the significance of your test. The significance of your test. Now, last week we talked about how each of us, as believers, we do have an appointment with the wilderness. And we had talked about how you look at uh, John the Baptist, and you look at Jesus, how uh, before they entered into the start of their ministry, they spent some time in the wilderness, in the wilderness. And we said, well, what's the important, why is it important to go through the wilderness? And we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 8 to help find the question, the answer to that particular question. And from looking at Deuteronomy 8 verse 2, we learned, well, when you, when you go through that wilderness experience, that experience where it seems like there's no one else around, it seems that you're the only one, uh, it's very uh, dry, it's very quiet. When you go through those times in your life, oftentimes that wilderness experience is designed to humble you. It's designed to humble you. Not only is it designed to humble you, but also to test you, to test you, to test you, to see uh, what but how you would respond or how you would react. Also, the wilderness, it comes to reveal what is in the heart, what is in the heart of the individual. And then fourthly, it comes to see whether or not you will keep God's word, whether you will keep God's word when you find yourself in a wilderness experience. And so when you look at those four things, being humble, to test you, to reveal, and to see whether or not you have the capacity to keep God's word or not, uh, the wilderness, it, it's an important part of who we are as believers, I believe. And I think that when you go through that wilderness experience, 
you should come out of that wilderness experience even more ready, even more ready to do that which God has called you to do. And so what I want to do on this morning here is to spend just a few minutes on looking at the testing part, uh, the testing part of the wilderness experience. And as we look at the testing part of the wilderness experience, we see here with Jesus in Luke chapter 4, uh, being full of the Holy Ghost, as it says there in verse 4, returning from Jordan, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and being tested. He was tested 40 days, tested, tempted of um, the devil. Now, I want to talk about this word significance here. When we talk about the word test, okay? The word significance, significance. When you think about, when you ask, well, what is the significance behind something? Oftentimes, what you're looking for is you're trying to find out the why. You know, why does something happen? What is the what is the significance of this? What is the meaning behind this circumstance or situation? And those are two common questions that we sometimes ask. And you know, when you think about it, when you when you take a test, why is it important for you to take a test in school? Well, to see whether or not you paid attention, to see whether or not you took notes to see whether or not you were able to remember. Are you able to remember the information? And see, I, I think what that does is, you know, because oftentimes you say, well, well, when I get a job, no one's going to ask me, well, I'm surprised someone's not going to ask me, well, who was the first president? Who was the first African American president? You know, uh, they're not going to ask you those specific questions that you oftentimes are tested on when you're in school. They're not going to ask you about the algorithm theory or the hypotenuse of a triangle, this, that, and the other. But you go, you go through, you go through the educational process because it, it trains your mind. It, it helps to to condition your mind that you have to learn how to listen. You have to learn how to listen. Mm -hmm. You have to learn how to listen. You learn how to listen. And then, like I said, when you listen, are you, are you able to retain? Are you able to, to remember? Are you able to rehearse that which you heard? And so the test comes, the test comes to see how well you did at not only listening, but here you go, comprehension. In other words, understand. Did you understand the material? Did you understand it? It comes to see whether or not you heard it, but whether or not you understood what you heard. And then lastly, well, if you understood it, then can you apply it? That's key right there. Listen, understand, and apply. Listen, pay attention. Do you understand what you're listening to? Do you understand what you heard? Okay, well now, can you apply it? Can you apply what you heard? Can you apply what you understand? And if you pass the test, then what that suggests is that you not only heard what was said, you understood it, and you were able to apply it. It's the same way when it comes to the Word of God. It's the same way. It's the same principle. It's the same concept. You got to put yourself in a posture to where you can listen and you can hear God's Word, just like you go to school on a regular basis to hear the voice of your teacher. You got to hear the voice of the instructor. Take notes. Listen. And then ask yourself, do you understand what you're hearing? If you don't understand what you're hearing, ask questions. Get understanding. Because at some point in time, you will have to apply what it is you were supposed to have heard. Oh, that's oh, it's true. Oh, it's true, it's true. Listen, read Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. That's all Proverbs chapter 2 talks about. Is, understand, is this right here? Listening, understanding, and application. That wasn't even in my notes, but I'm going to go that way anyway. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 2. Verse 1. 
to. That's all the Proverbs is about. It's listening, understanding, and applying law, Heaven. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 says, My son, if thou shalt receive my word. In other words, you have to be in a position to where you can receive God's word. You can't receive God's word with a whole bunch of distractions around and says, and do it and hide the commandments. In other words, you receive them and you hold on to it. Hold on to the commandments that you receive. You hold on to the information that you receive. Don't receive the word of God and then allow the enemy to come on in and take it right from under you. Well, I'm teaching already. I'm in the wilderness already. I'm in the wilderness already. He says, hide my commandments with thee. Why? He says, so that thou incline thine ear. What does that mean? When thou incline. Listen. That's step number one. Listen. 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 That's step number one in Proverbs 2. So that thou incline thine ear unto what? Wisdom. Not a bunch of foolishness. Not a bunch of garbage. Not, not, not a bunch of trash. What are you listening to in this hour? That you incline thine ear unto wisdom. Now, what, what, what does it say next there? Verse 2. And do what? And apply. Lord have mercy. I had no clue. I was going this way on this morning. Proverbs 2 and 2. Listen. That's the significance of your trial. That's the 
significance of the road that the Lord has, that, that, that you travel is connected to the kind of impact that you will have on your target audience. You know, I use a lot of the Old as an example. You know, being raised in a single parent home without a father. I utilize that platform to reach out to other young people who came down who are, who are living in the same kind of environment. I know what it is. I know what it's like. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You share out of your own experience. You write books out of your own experience. I can't write about nothing that I haven't gone through myself. There's no power in it. Because, that's because, 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 I, because, if, if, because I cannot connect or relate to the word bringing me out of anything. That's why I say there's no power in it. So the significance of your life, the significance of your struggle, it's linked, it's connected to the kind of impact you, you have on your target audience. Especially as to where it stands now. As to where the target audience is right now. And you know, with young people, they, they, they struggle with their spirituality and they struggle with their, their sexuality. All right? Those are two common areas. Well, I have a book that talks about those things that I, that I dealt with when I was there. You know, I was a teenager. Common issues. And, I, and even in the book, I give some, exa uh, some practical examples. That's what God's expectation is, y'all. That's, that's what his expectation is. Is you draw from your own experience to reach your intended target audience. Whoever your target audience is, whomever God has for you to reach, that greatly determines what type of test you go through. Now I said that to say this. I said that to say this because the type of temptation that Jesus deals with, it's connected to the dynamics of his environment. You have to get that. You have to see that. The type of temptation that he was confronted with, it's connected to the dominating tendencies that were going on during his day and time. Does that make sense? Yes, it do. Every environment has its challenges. Every environment has its own struggles or what have you. So, so, so what was going on during this, during this time? What were some of the environmental challenges during this time? Well, Herod, who was a ruler during that time, Herod was considered to be very greedy. So greed, greed was a dominating behavioral pattern back then. Mm -hmm. uh, it is today. <laughs> greed and excessiveness. Greed and excessiveness where, where people hoard for one step. They gotta have it all for themselves. And they'll stop at nothing to make sure that they get that they get it. Come on now. Very excessive. <laughs> Even if it means that someone else has to go without, <laughs> they will make sure that they don't. <laughs> ah, greed, greed. You see something that somebody else has, you gotta have it yourself. <laughs> Ah, uh, you, you don't want anyone to have no more than what you, no more than you. Ah, uh, greed and excessiveness. Mm -hmm. It was prevalent during that time. Excessiveness. Ah, uh, it was real back then, and guess what? It's real it's today. It's real. You can't be content with what you have, but you gotta go and get some what belongs to somebody else. Oh, that's called coveting. 
That's why the Bible says, do not what? Cut. Yeah. Don't be greedy. Don't be excessive in your living. Ah, oh, but Herod, and Herod, he was one during that time, he was very greedy and, and excessive. Mm -hmm. So you had to deal with that during that day and time. What was another tendency? What was another behavioral pattern? Well, you had the Roman Empire. Yes, you did. The Roman Empire was the dominant kingpin back then. The Roman Empire was the dominant force back then. And, 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 and it was quite often, it was quite often that the Roman dominance came across a little violent, came across a little harsh, came across as being a little domineering, <laughs> came across as being very brutish. Oh, well, we, we have that today, we have that today, we have that today. We have that today. And, you know, it, it, the Bible, Luke, he talks about those two things. Greed and excessive force. He uh, talks about those things in his ministry. Greed and excessive force. What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? If you go back to Luke chapter 3 for a minute. Luke chapter 3, when, when uh, John the Baptist was teaching, mm -hmm. over in Luke chapter 3, when he was talking, he was calling people a generation of vipers. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Over there, uh, right around, uh, let's see here, Luke chapter 3, verse 7. And the people asked him, they said, verse 10, well, John, what, we, what should we do? And what should we do? And he answered, verse 11, he said, he that have two coats, let him do what? Give one that have what? Have none. Uh, don't be so greedy. <laughs> uh -huh. Don't be so excessive. And then, and then, you know, he said, he, and he said, he that have me, let him do a likewise. And then he said to the tax collectors, he said, well, what shall we do? And he said unto them, well, don't collect no more money than what you're so what, supposed to. Don't be greedy. Don't be excessive. Those kinds of behavioral patterns were seen both in the public eye, but then also in the private. Within the home, but then also in the business arena. And then when you, and then when you talk about uh, excessive violence, well, down at verse 14, it says, And the soldiers likewise commanded of him, what shall we do? And what he said, the first thing he said was what? Do what? Violence. Do you see that there? Right. Do violence to stop being so brutish. Stop being so excessive in your force. Don't, 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 don't abuse your privileges and other oh, I'm just I'm just teaching you. I'm just teaching you. I'm just teaching you here. What what is John doing? John is trying to impact his target audience. By identifying the behavioral patterns that were prevalent during that time. And what was prevalent? Greed, excessive, uh, greed, greed, and uh, excessiveness. Excessive. Excessive means what? Too much. Too much. Too much. That was the, that's what was going on in the environment. And, there was, and, 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 and so he had Roman dominance was very harsh and brutish. And then there was always political tension. Always, Lord. You think Washington is bad. You, you think, no, no, no. no. There was all, there's always been political tension in government. There's always been agitated parties when there's a transition of power from one to the next. Well, it was the same way back then during that. Whenever there was, a, there was a transition in power, there was always some. There was always some type of agitation. There was always someone didn't like it. There was always something going on on the political front. That's why these men, John the Baptist and Jesus, they didn't live in an environment where everything was just nice and clean and lovely, and everybody got. In an environment much like we're living in today. The only difference is they didn't have technology. But the excessiveness, guess what? It's still here. 
The greed, guess what, is still here. The violence, guess what, is still here. The behavioral tendency are still here. Still here. But, but, but here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. During that time, people were looking to the religious system to help bring some type of relief to the political and the chaotic environment. They were looking to the church to help bring some kind of relief and hope. And what ended up happening was the religious compromise. The religious leaders pretty much do, do just like the world. What do you mean? Greed said it. Oh, yes, it did. Yes, it did. It, it said it. It said it. Jesus stepped in Matthew over where was it? Over in Matthew, I believe somewhere right around Matthew 20, 23. Jesus went to town on the religious system. He called her a bunch of hypocrites. He, she did it. Over in verse 27, Matthew 23, verse 27, he called them a bunch of hypocrites. The religious system had caved in. The religious system was, 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 was misappropriating its authority. Misappropriation of authority for different reasons. Why? Greed? Looking to gain a following. Want someone to follow you to make you feel important. Compromise. Oh, you can do whatever you want to the Lord. He'll look over it. Here. Why am I teaching like this? I'm teaching like this because this is the type of an environment that Jesus had to minister in. Yet this is, this is the type of an environment that we're living in today. Oh, Lord, help me, help me. So now watch this then. If those were the type of things that existed in the environment, and Jesus was going to be, he was seen, that's why when he came onto the scene, people were so glad and excited to finally see that the Savior had come to address these behavioral issues that were going on during that time. So what that lets me know then is that whatever test Jesus went through in the wilderness, that test was closely linked to the type of an environment that he was living in. Does that make sense? So, so then if Jesus then was to, could be confronted with the type of behavioral tendencies that were going on in his, in his environment and he was able to defeat them, then that gave him more power to be able to minister in his environment because he knew what it was to be able to defeat whatever the behavioral tendency was. Does that make sense? Yes. So then, so then, so then, let's take a look here. Let's take a look here in Luke chapter 4 then. Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. The significance of the test is linked to the kind of impact you're going to have in your environment. You need to understand that the significance of your struggle, the significance of your test, the significance of your trial is linked to the kind of impact you can have on your target audience, which means that you've got to know God's word, you have to understand God's word, and you have to apply God's word so that you can overcome your test, so that you can pass your test. Because if you keep fucking your test, then you're not going to be able to help anybody do nothing. Because you cannot give to somebody else what you do not have. That's why Jesus, when he went into the wilderness, he had to come out with an with the, he had to ace the test. Why? Because he was going to be our example to follow. He was going to be the example for the religious system that was broken to follow. Watch this here. Watch this here. Man. So, let's see. Let's go. So, Luke chapter 4, verse uh, 
two. Again, I'm going to say it again. The significance of your test is linked to the kind of impact you can have on your environment and your target audience. But you got to pass the test, which means you got to what? You got to listen. You got to understand it. And you got to apply it to it. You got to apply God's word. Verse 2 says, being 40 days tempted of the devil he was. And in those days he didn't what? He didn't eat anything, did he? No, it says he didn't eat anything. And when, they, when those days were over, well, he was what? He was hungry. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's the humanity of who he was. He was hungry. Now, watch this here. And the devil said unto him, he was hungry. He was hungry. He was hungry. Yes, he was hungry. The devil said unto him, If thou be the what? The son of God. If thou be the son of God, use your powers as the son of God. Use your authority. Command this what? Command this stone that it be made what? Bread. Mm -hmm. In other words, use your power. Use your for own for your own gain. Ah. Now, 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 you know he said he was hungry. And so the enemy comes with a test, and he tests him, first of all, to turn something that's going to uh, meet that hunger needed. Yes. He says to turn the stones into what? Into bread. Yeah. Now, now here's, his, here's, what I think, here's, here's what I think is worth noting here. Bread, bread, <laughs> bread. Bread is that which you consume. Bread represents that which you can consume, like a loaf of bread, a piece of bread. But the key, the key there is something that you do what? Consume. You consume it. You consume it. Something consumable. Something consumable that feels a need. Consumable. Consumable. And so he was challenging. He was challenging. He was challenging Jesus right here to utilize his power. Hmm? To acquire something that was consumable. Some kind of materialistic wealth. Uh, 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 utilize your power. Utilize your power to acquire some type of wealth. Some type of consumable wealth. Now I think that's worth noting here. I think that's worth noting here. Because, because again, because again, you know, people can, when, you, when you're hungry, you do what you consume, don't you? And there's, there's a such thing called overconsumption. Overconsumption means you're what? You're greedy. Yeah. Oh, everybody gonna talk to me. Everybody gonna talk to me. Overconsumption means you're greedy. You become intoxicated with it. Uh, and Jesus was living in, he was living in an environment that oftentimes they became consumed. They became what? Greedy. I said a few moments ago, Herod was known as being what? Greedy and excessive. He utilized his authority to, to promote his greed and his what? And his excessiveness. So what do we see the devil doing right here? What we see the devil right here doing is he's trying to tempt Jesus with that same level of thinking. Utilize your power to gain more bread, to get your bread, to get your, to, to get your consumable wealth on. What is the devil doing right here? He's presenting Jesus with an opportunity. Utilize your power for selfish gain. Utilize your power for overconsumption. Utilize your power for consumable wealth. Jesus was confronted with it. That was that what well, that was a going tendency during that time. See, in order to, in order to be relevant to the times in which you live in. You have to know what it's like to experience whatever it is your times are experiencing. Oh, let me say that again. You have you have to have experienced whatever it is that's bothering your target audience. You have to have experienced it. Because if you have not experienced what is bothering your target audience, how can you talk to your target audience about it if you don't know anything about it? <laughs> So Jesus right here was confronted with this type of mindset, with this type of thinking. But now look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. How does Jesus respond? Because see how Jesus responds, that's God's expectation as to how we're supposed to respond. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? 
Jesus said what? He said, it is written. It is what? It is written. Ah, he's going back to the law. He's going back to God's word. It is written that man shall not live by what? Great by bread, God. by consumable wealth. You got to see that thing. You got to see that thing. You got to Man shall not live by consumable wealth alone. By bread alone. Because guess what? As just as quick as consumable wealth comes, guess what? It will go. I said last week, bread, bread. You try and go find bread, there have been times where you couldn't even go to the store and find a loaf of bread because it was gone. Man shall not live by bread alone. So what Jesus is basically saying there is that when that desire to acquire that consumable wealth, that position, that authority by your power, he said, you don't go, you, you don't live by that stuff alone. You shouldn't be judged by that stuff by alone. That should not be the dominating force behind who you are. He says, but by every word. That's how you're supposed to live your life. That's how you're supposed to conduct yourself. Proverbs 2 and 2 is how you're supposed to live your life. Oh, ain't nobody going to talk to me. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to show you here that Jesus was confronted with the mind. See, 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 see. Because what, what, what happened, let's use Herod as an example. See, when, the, when, the, when Herod was tempted, he didn't have a problem giving in. And utilizing his power to accumulate more wealth. That's why they said he was greedy and excessive. So when that when that when that greed spirit entertained Herod, Herod had no problem with making room for it. Come on and sit down right here. Let's talk for a little bit. Let's chat for a little bit. See you. See you got to be careful of these spirits that you entertain. And, and, and you talking about these different kinds of spirits. What am I talking about? I'm talking about First Corinthians six nine ten. I'm talking about Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. If, if you got all those different kinds of behaviors that are just waiting, that are just knocking, knocking on the door of somebody's heart, just waiting for you, waiting for that for you to let them into your heart and let that spirit of obesity come on and sit in. Let that spirit of homosexuality come on and sit in. Let that spirit of abuse come on and sit in. Let that spirit of extortion come on and sit in. Let that spirit of scheming and conniving come on and sit in. Let that spirit of foolishness come on and sit in. You have to learn that, 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 that. you can't live your life on that stuff. Off of that bread, the bread of the flesh, the excessiveness of the flesh. Some of you, your life is out of control. It's in, it, you're all over the place. There is, there, 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 there is no self control there. Jesus is going to say, okay, 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 okay. Some of you, when the enemy comes and, and, and puts something before you, you jump right in. You jump right for it. Okay, 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 okay. You gotta get some backbone. Jesus had backbone. He said, that Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So that's the significance of that first test. He gives us a model of what we're supposed to do. Alright, let's go to the next. Let's go to the next one here. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain. Okay, the key word there is high. Okay. Alright, okay, now that, that's another high. That's this what positioning. Okay, I think I already know where this one might be going. Positioning. Showed unto him all. That's that key word is what? All. Ah, remember I talked about last week? The, we talked about 
about when you're full. You know, I talk about, about, about the word full. What does the word full mean? Having all, enjoying all, being at the highest and greatest degree. Unto him all the kingdoms of the world in, in a what? In a moment of time. Oh, that, now, a moment of time, that suggests that what? Quick. Uh, how do I get there quickly? Uh, how, how do I obtain position quickly? How quickly can I get to it? Oh, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, whose neck do I have to step on in order to get there? Oh, come on, man. Like, that, that's, how people, that's how people think. How quick can I get it? And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee. <laughs> and the glory, power, glory. Ah, oh, that's just, that's, that's, that's pride setting in. For this is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it, if thou shalt do what? Worship me. Worship me. Now, now, five and six is setting the stage, really. Because five and six, it deals with, you know, being full, being full of power, being, you know, having all, being in a, in a, in a high position. Five and six is setting the stage, making it look good. <laughs> It, 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 it's feeding into that, 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 that greed mentality, that excessive mentality. Oh, I gotta have more, I gotta have more, I just gotta have this, I gotta have that, I gotta have this, I gotta, I gotta have it, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get it, 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 gotta get it. Five and six is feeding into that type of mentality, that type of mindset. I gotta have a following, I gotta have this, I gotta have it, I gotta have it, I gotta have it. Five and six. And see, during that time frame, during that time frame, during that time frame in the environment in which Jesus was living in, there were people who prided, who prided themselves in that. How do you think the Roman Empire became so powerful? Because their, their leadership embraced idolatry. Their leadership embraced ah. Uh -huh. Caesar and worshiping Caesar. Five and six sounds good. But it was baking, it was baking, it was baking from verse number seven. Because verse number seven is the kicker right there. Verse number seven, he said, If thou will do what? Worship me. Worship me. I'll give you all of this. All you have to do in verse 7 is do what work. So verse 7 is the tell because really what, what the key right there is are you going to work, are you going to compromise your relationship with the Lord God? Are you going to trade in your, your worship relationship with God for authority, for dominance, for you see that there? And there, and there were those during that time frame, that's how they lived. Mm. They didn't mind worshiping Caesar. They didn't mind as long as it, as long as they were able to acquire more. They didn't mind worshiping Caesar. They didn't mind adult, uh, engaging in idolatry. As long as they could get five or six, they didn't mind trading in.
religious compromise That's right there. That's called the religious compromise right there. Mm -hmm. The religious compromise. You got to, when the religious compromise presents itself to you, just like Jesus, you got to know, you shall worship the Lord thy God and Him only shall thou serve. But if you don't know that, you will fall for the damn bread. If you don't listen, if you don't understand it, if you can't apply God's word to your life, you will fall for it. You will fall for the religious compromise. You are trading your integrity. You are, tra you are trading your relationship with the Lord. Now let's look at let's look at the third, and then we're going to be done here. The third. Well, he brought he brought him down to Jerusalem. Set him up on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, do what? Cast thyself from him. Throw yourself down. That's just foolishness. Cast yourself down. Throw yourself down from here. Now, 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 hear me now. Look what he says there. He said, But it is written. But he, it is written. Go ahead and cast yourself down from here because you know it's written now. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. That's the enemy talking right there. That's the enemy talking. He was trying to get Jesus to engage in something. So throw yourself down. <laughs> throw yourself down. The Lord ain't here. The Lord ain't on. God ain't on mine. Go ahead and do it. It ain't gonna bother you. He got you. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. Now, now, I want you to see this here. Because the enemy, now he quoted, he quoted scripture. He sure did. <laughs> now, where did he get that from? For it is written, he shall give his angels to Where did he even get that from? You know what he got? That's out of Psalm 91. Now, watch it. He didn't quote the whole song. He just quoted the song to make it sound good, to convince Jesus to go ahead and throw himself down. See, that's how the devil works. See, the devil don't tell you the whole truth. He just, he really the not that. He tells you a lie. He tells you a lie to make it look like, oh, it's so, it's so. That's why you got to watch relationships. You gotta watch folk because folk they'll get you in a relationship by telling you a truth, but you really all it is a lie. They dress a lie up real good. They don't tell you the whole story. And see, that's how sometimes you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful. He just quoted, he just quoted part. Well, let's look at Psalm 91 though. Let's look at Psalm 91. But he said, you go ahead and throw yourself on that. Go ahead and throw yourself over that. You know, the, the God, he, he'll give his angels an angel charge over you. Let's look at Psalm 91. Right. Psalm 91. Because, see, this Psalm 91, you know, when you read Psalm 91, what's, what you, what's even the purpose of, it, of this? This Psalm 91, you know what it is? It's really a testimonial. It's a testimonial of the security of those who trust in the Lord. That's what this psalm is really about. It's a testimonial of the security of those who do what? Trust in the Lord. Now, now the part that the devil quotes to Jesus is down there, verse 11 and 12. Hmm? But the truth of the matter, but, but see, he should have, rather than starting at verse 11, he should have gone back up to verse number one. One, start from the beginning. But see, he won't start from the beginning. Because he knew he started from the beginning. Oh. See, that's why you got to know for yourself. Don't you count on the devil. You got to know for yourself. Is a testimony of the security of those who trust in the Lord. 
It's like it's like a, a blessed assurance. You know, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Wash. Lord of his spirit washes his blood. This is my what? It's a story. Psalm 91 is really a story. It says, but he that dwelleth in the what? Secret place of the most high shall abide under the what? Under the shadow of the Almighty. Huh? I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my what? Fortress, my God in him. Oh, the devil won't say that. He won't give Jesus that. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. My, my God in him will I say. See, the devil won't quote that. Because that would have discredited him. Oh, see. He just gave Jesus a little bit. That. See, that's how the enemy works, y'all. That's how the enemy works. My God in him will I say, sure, he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise of pestilence. Oh, the devil won't go say nothing that. <laughs> ah, but, we, but if you know that, that's where this, that's where this comes in right here. When you know that, when you know he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou what trust. Oh, the devil won't go say nothing that, was it? No, he ain't gonna talk about that. Because that's talking about trusting in the Lord. That's talking about the Lord making a way. No, no, no. He ain't gonna talk about that. The enemy won't talk about the way that he's making. Shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by what by day, nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Don't be afraid. Oh, the devil wants you to be afraid. He wants you to walk in fear. He wants you to live in fear. He wants you to be afraid of the terror. He wants you to be afraid of the arrows of life. He wants you to be afraid of the pestilence. He wants you to be afraid of the death of destruction. He thrives off of that. He thrives off of it. Oh, now, look at this here. Look at this here. I like the words. It says that a thousand shall do what? Fall. At thy what? Right side. Now, what did that? Let's go back to the conversation for a minute. What did the enemy ask? What did the enemy tell Jesus to do? Throw yourself down. Isn't that what he told him? He told him to do a cast of yourself down. But now, if I understand, the, if I go back now and read this psalm here, I like what verse 7 says. A thousand shall fall at thy side. And 10,000 more shall fall at thy right hand. So what that let me know, I got some that are going to fall over here, and I got some that are going to fall over there. But what does it say in the verse 7? But it shall not come what? Near you. Near you. Oh, y'all better get, you better get that, you better get that, you better get that. The devil telling Jesus to cast himself down and utilizing part of Psalm 91. But my, my word to the devil is, devil, do you know what you read verse 7? A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand shall fall at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. In other words, you don't have no business throwing yourself down.
point of the what? Wicked. Now watch this. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, because you have made the Lord your habitation, now you read verse 10. It says, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come out of thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels what? Now you read what that see. Do you see the difference there? Do you see the difference in what the enemy just gave Jesus? The enemy just gave Jesus verses 11 and 12. But go back and read verses 1 through 10. And what you get out of verse number 7 is that you ain't got no business casting yourself down. Well, well, let me wrap this up then. Let me wrap this up then. What does, so this last temptation speaks to the foolishness. To the foolishness. To the foolishness. Jesus answered and said unto him, verse 12, look for it, he said, Thou shalt not what? Tempt the Lord thy God. Because you know the enemy, what he was doing there, he was basically saying, Go ahead and throw your cast thyself down. The Lord ain't gonna mind. He'll catch you. You'll be alright. See, that's how they did that's what they ended up. But he fools people that you can engage in what you can do whatever it is you want to do. And it's okay. It's that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. You got these homosexual churches pushing this homosexuality agenda and they thinking that it's okay. That's the, that's the devil fool. That's the devil fooling you. Oh, it's okay. Go ahead and engage in it. It ain't you you throw yourself into it. The Lord, he, he ain't gonna bother you. He ain't gonna say, the devil is a liar. And that's a prime example right there. That's a prime example. What the world is saying is you're all right. But the truth of the matter is. But you you fine for it. You're testing God. You're testing him. You're pushing all this patience. Jesus said, you don't take the Lord thy like God. You don't take him like that. Throwing yourself into foolish activity and say, oh, it's okay. It's all in the name of love. It's all in the name of love. The devil is a liar. And I curse it at the root. It's debauchery. You got to learn how to speak to this stuff here. Christ was a great example of how he spoke to the prevailing mindset of his time. You got to learn how to take a stand against this stuff. Don't worry about who you're going to offend or who's going to kick you out of their group because you opened up your mouth and you stood for what was right. You stood for holiness. You stood for godliness. You quoted scripture and they didn't like it. They got mad with you. Why? Because you stepped on that. Oh, they cut you off from being their friend. Well, they cut you off. Guess what? You don't need them anyway. Take a stand. You don't cater to them. Boy, don't say that. Don't say nothing. You don't want to rough nobody's. Oh, well, so what? If you're wrong, right, you're wrong. Right. The significance of your test. What has helped you through something? Utilize that testimony to help somebody else. That's the significance of your test. So that you can have an impact on your audience. Don't let people snuff you out or try and tell you what to say. Just say it for the Lord. The Lord told you to say it. Then open up your mouth and say it. You be left alone. You're not the only one. Peter, James, 
Peter and John, and oftentimes of, of the apostles, when they were doing, when they were forming an early church, some of they found themselves being locked up, being secluded because of what they stood for. Everybody wants to be acceptable nowadays. Everybody wants a following. Everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants please. Please. It's time out for a bunch of phoniness. Open up your mouth and proclaim the word of God in this hour. But you gotta know it. You gotta know it. You gotta know it. You gotta listen. You gotta understand. You gotta apply. Listen, there's somebody today, you don't know who Jesus is. Today is your day. Today is your day. You need a new life. You need a new direction in your life. You need to start this right here. You've been listening to the wrong one. You've been listening to the wrong thing. You need to listen to the word of God and allow the word of God to come into your heart and excavate that old and lay a new foundation. But it starts with Christ. It starts with Him. And I challenge you on today. If you don't know who Jesus is, I encourage you to give your life to Him. If that's you on today, you say, you know what? I want to start this new direction in my life. I want to lay this new foundation. If that's you on today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. But I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were buried. I believe that God raised you from the dead and that you live now and forevermore. I surrender my life to you right now. Come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. I receive you right now, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If that's you on today, you pray that prayer. Go to our website, takeaboutforce.net. Contact us. Let us know that you gave your life to the Lord. We want to follow up with you. We have a pamphlet we want to send you. It's called a guidebook for new Christians. We want to get that out into your hands and follow us. Because it's a new beginning in your life. And we celebrate what the Lord is getting ready to do in you. We celebrate it on today. But we're getting ready to close out in prayer. Father, we thank you right now. We thank you, God, for waking us up on today. We thank you for this word that has come to wake us up on today. Lord, I pray that this word has, 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 has touched the heart, has touched the mind of somebody on today, Lord. Father, we just ask you right now to strengthen every home that is represented here today. The leaders of that home, whether it be a parent, whether it be an auntie, an uncle, a big brother, or a big sister, whomever the head of that house is, Lord, we pray right now that you will give them new insight, new vision, a new appetite for you right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for the young people that are tuning in on today, Lord, that you will enable the young person, Lord, to be obedient to the godly authority, to be a to be a, a positive example in the household, to be a positive example on the school bus, in the classroom, in the hallway, in the cafeteria, to take a stand for you in this hour. Lord, we pray for boldness right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for our government officials, both at the local, state, national, and global level. Now more than ever, we need some godly leaders to stand on your word and to proclaim humanity, and to proclaim integrity, compassion, and humility as Christ has done. Help us in this hour, Lord. We need you more than ever to stand for godliness, to stand for holiness to stand for what is right in this hour. Help us, Lord, to reach our target audience, the audience that you have assigned to our hand. Lord, help us to minister to them in this hour. To the youth and young adults that are out there, Lord, help us to speak a word that will encourage and motivate them. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be a disciple? We thank you right now. And we bless you. We pray for healing now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Though someone's listening today, they're in need of healing, Lord. We ask you now to touch right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we bless you. And we give you glory. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless at his coming. To him be dominion, honor, and glory. Let everyone say amen. Amen.
Hey, well, listen, thank you so much for tuning in today. We pray that something was said to help you along the way. Share this with your family, with your friends, with your network. However you can get the word out, get it out there. And remember, listen, to check us out every Friday at 1230 for our podcast, Spread the Gospel uh, platform. You can get the link on our website under the events tab. Check it out. Check it out. All right, but listen, hey, until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. We look forward to being out with you again real soon. We'll see you.